Hey, good evening, everyone. It's Daishi Han Miller. Well, evening, morning, afternoon, wherever the hell you happen to be around the world. Um, anyway, here we are with the next episode of Kuden. It's episode 122. And uh, let me tell you something about uh, I don't know, something a teacher told me once. Um, just a snippet out of a whole big old long weekend training. He said, if we're truly creatures of habit, then is it not in our best interest to make sure that we are wired with the habits that we want to be operating when we're on automatic pilot so that we're not constantly trying to remind ourselves to do things or will ourselves to do things, right? So if we're truly creatures of habit and we develop these things, then isn't it in our best interest to set ourselves up with the habits that are going to make it work, right? So uh, during this episode, we're going to be talking about habits. We're going to be talking about routines. We're going to be talking about not only the beneficial side of them, but we're also going to look at maybe the crutch side of them as well and how they can actually stifle growth, all right? That and more when we come back. So the big question is this, how are self-defense and success-minded people like us Concerned citizens worried about protecting ourselves, our loved ones, and the things we care about from the monsters we know exist in the world. How do we train in a way that gives us the skills, knowledge, and understanding we need without becoming paranoid fighters or killers ourselves, and yet still allows us to be the hero protector the world needs us to be? That's the question, and this podcast will give you the answers. My name is Jeffrey Miller, and welcome to Kuden Radio, real training for real people in a real world. All right, and we're back. You know, I've been training in this art since 1980. Where were some of you guys in 1980? Seriously. Okay. Um, I don't know. Anyway. I started training the martial arts in 1975. Damn, I'm old. Anyway. Um, but I don't feel it. So that's why. Every once in a while I feel it. Like earlier when my back flared up and I had to uh, treat that so that I didn't get on here and uh, be like a raging maniac. Um, anyway, so... Uh, what we're going to be talking about uh, during this episode is this, uh, you know, the, the idea of habits and uh, routines, right? Um, I was actually listening to uh, one of my mentors uh, earlier this week, and um, this guy has really great habits, really solid routines. Like he has like four that are non-negotiable kind of things, um, and everybody should have, you know, their own, right? Habits, routines, whatnot. But in this particular training that I had with him, he flipped it, right? And so the subject was on how routines and habits can actually stifle growth, right? So we all know that like every guru that, that is, is worth their salt, right, um, <clears throat> uh, is always trying to convince us, right, that we need um, – we need to establish, right, good habits, right, habits that allow us to, to move forward, uh, routines, right, so that uh, we can make sure that things are done, right, because these are the things that will kind of work on autopilot, whether we're thinking about it or not, right. And I think everybody gets that, right. So, uh, you know, if I've got a, a procrastination thing, right, then I want to fix that, right? And if I can establish some routines and develop new habits, right? The routines, and this is the way it kind of works, right? We establish some routines so that eventually the thing I'm doing consciously, left brain, right? Eventually becomes a habit and I end up doing it even when I'm not thinking about it, okay? So that's that's a really good place to start, right? <clears throat> But establishing habits and establishing routines to get started and to begin growing, right, is different than once we've hit a certain plateau. The human being, the human body, our brain, our bodies, and all that, uh, anybody that's ever done fitness things, anybody that's ever done anything, right, ninjutsu training, whatever, right, there, you know, there's what we often talk to talk about kids, right? There's growing pains, right? We end up like getting dinged and bruised and whatnot until our body gets conditioned enough that it takes a really good shot for a bruise to show, right? And then when it does show, 
it's this weird alien looking kind of thing, right? And by the time it looks like a normal one, it's almost gone. And when you point it out, everybody in the dojo looks at it like, dude, what the hell are you whining about? That's a week old, right? So James is laughing in the background because we all get it, right? Okay. So, but uh, we hit these plateaus because the body, right? Our, this, this human system is very, very adaptable, right? One of the purposes behind the Junin Taiso exercises, right? Exercises, stretching and all that. You know, everybody thinks that it, here's this warm up, right? But what I was taught by the master teachers in Japan was that the Junin Taiso is in place. And this is even in Hatsumi Sensei's book that we now refer to as the Tenchi Jin Uriaku no Maki, right? The, the Heaven, Earth, and Mankind book, right? Um, that the Junin Taiso is in place to combat the body, the body's natural tendency to come to rest, right? It keeps us awake. It keeps us alert and vibrant and, and moving, right? Because left to our own devices, right? Um, the body comes to rest, right? Well, how do we know this? Well, because we fall asleep every day, unless you have, you know, well, narcoleptics fall asleep really, really quickly, right? But unless you have, um, you know, insomnia or something like that, right? Uh, we fall asleep, right? In Mikyo, sleep is called the mini death, right? And eventually, the body will slow down and you end up sleeping for longer and longer periods of time until, unless it's, you, you know, unless it's a violent end, you just don't wake up, which is a cool way to go out in my, in my opinion, right? But there's a lot of pain involved. There's a lot of disorientation, all that kind of stuff, right? So, but anyway, so it takes some work, right? But when we hit these plateaus and we're trying to grow from a plateau, from one of these plateaus, and, and a lot of you recognize this, right? Because we have these chats on a regular basis, right? The need to get restarted or, uh, you know, uh, life changed and all that. And I've got to figure out a way to make this happen and whatnot, right? So at a certain point, we have skill sets, we know they're not the end of things. We know that there's other things we need to have happen or do or whatever, right? So we hit a point where literally we've grown as far as we can grow. But therein lies a problem because we actually believe that that's as far as we can grow or as far as we can go, right? Um, there's actually this this, I don't know if it's a law or not, but there's this, um, well, I guess it is. It's, it's an engineering and it's a law of physics and all that, right? Uh, it has to do with bottlenecking and, and, and whatnot, right? That um, any system can only do, it, it, it has a capacity, right? It has a cap. It has a, a, a ceiling, right? It's as far as it can go. And unless that system is altered or replaced with another system, right? No other growth is capable, okay? And here's what happens. People hit a plateau. We hit a plateau, right? And what we're trying to do is, is re-engage or, or make more growth or whatever, right? Doing the same things we did to get where we are, right? And it doesn't work that way, okay? Uh, I know in a past episode, I, I mentioned, and, and the context was different, right? It was about, uh, uh, strong people and weak people and things like that, right? Um, <clears throat> I, I think the context was that a strong man cannot make, make a weak man strong. You can't, right? You can teach them what you do to become that thing, but they ultimately have to do it, right? And for a weak man to become strong, they actually have to go through some discomfort, right? Because muscles have to grow, the body has to be broken down, fatigue, right? Confusion has to happen until the, the you know, the, you can get your brain wrapped around uh, the thing that you're trying to learn, all that kind of stuff, right? So everybody wants the nice route, but but here's the thing, right? So ignore the, the weak guy, right? <clears throat> but a strong guy, a strong man, woman, whatever, right, cannot be become stronger by doing the same things that got them where they are. They literally have to change what they're doing 
to become stronger because again, the body hits a plateau. So, uh, so again, what I'm going to be talking about during this episode is we're going to start off on the, on the omote side, right? On the, on the, you know, the, the growth side, the nice side, right? The positive side, right? But then we're gonna have to talk about something else, right? So, so let's talk about the growth thing first, right? Um, and maybe, maybe you're not there. Maybe you need the second half of this, right? But growth involves like doing things, right? And stepping outside of our comfort zones, right? So I have to, I have to, right? Pick up the weights or use my body weight, right? Uh, in exercises like that, right? I have to, uh, if I'm trying to get stronger or whatever, right? I have to do the things that force the body to change so that that kind of stuff starts happening, right? Um, I can't continue to do the same thing that, that produced this, right? So, you know, we have to learn, uh, come on, right? We have to learn striking. We have to learn basic techniques. We have to, whatever, right? So we get that, right? <clears throat> and at the end of this, I'm going to tell you that ultimately this is going to be up to you because it is anyway, right? I'm not here to tell you anything. I'm just here to share information. But as we progress, right? Um, well, let's let's look at the journey from white belt to black belt. And that black belt level could be first degree, second degree, whatever, right? Let's talk about that journey, okay? Because what ends up happening is people establish a goal, right? They either... And we're going to talk about the people that establish the goal of getting past um, the vague, the, the the vague goal of uh, I want to train in the martial arts, right? I want to be a martial artist. Right? Uh, I have a YouTube video coming out. So it's a short, right? Uh, that uh, talks about and, and very very briefly, obviously, because it's a short, right? Um, that points out something from the legal realm, right? In the legal realm, it's very, very important that laws are written so that people can understand them, right? Um, if it requires a lawyer to translate it for you, right, then it's void for vagueness, right? You should be able, a person with a normal aptitude or better should be able to understand at least the basics of that thing, right? I can do that. I can't do it or whatever. If there's way too much, you know, roller coaster, twisty, turny kind of jargon in there and whatnot, then uh, see, but again, there's this thing in the realm, in, in the legal realm uh, that's void for vagueness. Right? And again, it's just this little micro second or three um, that I throw this out there because I'm talking about people having really rough uh, goals, right? And the way they describe things. I'm not talking about people that um, hit a level of complacency, right? And they've accepted, right? This is cool. This is comfortable, right? This is good for me, right? I count them as a success too, if that's true, right? And it's not a, well, what's a person to do? So, you know, you just kind of accept your lot in life. And then because they accepted it, um, you know, they get really, really happy about it. As a matter of fact, there's a really good... Um, a really good story in a book by Chogyam Trungpa. It was a Tibetan, uh, basically Mikyo, right? Vajrayana priest that emigrated to uh, the West here, I think in the 70s, right? <clears throat> so he was long past by the time I even discovered his books, right? But he has this, uh, one of his books is called Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism. I highly, highly, highly recommend it, okay? But in one of the chapters, he tells this Tibetan story, uh, and it's about these th uh, the three lords of uh, ego, right? And how one's all focused around, you know, physicality, one's focused around the uh, intellect, and one's focused around uh, the spirit, right? Uh, spiritual things, right? And how each one of them gravitates to things and will put things to use in their, in their realm, right, to justify their existence, Right. So, you know, the physical 
a guy who's maybe not too quick up top or not too empathetic or compassionate or connected to people or whatever, right? Everything that they do to justify things and to, to do whatever they do, right, is all wrapped around health and fitness and youth and vibrancy and all that kind of stuff. The intellectual one is all about knowledge, right, because maybe they can't you know, do a push up or whatever. Right. So they'll make fun of the guy that can do push ups um, or they'll trip him up with, you know, intellectual puzzles or whatever. Right. Because that's where everything's wrapped. Right. Um, but even the ones who are on a spiritual journey. Right. Ego will grab a hold of it. Anyway, if you can find it, if you're so inclined. Right. I highly, highly recommend it um, because he goes into it much more eloquently than I can. But or went into it because he's gone. Right. So anyway, um, all right, so let's just steer around that stuff, right? So the journey from, from white belt to black belt, right? Let's say, say that the person has defined that they want this particular colored belt around their waist, okay? And they're going to do whatever it takes to get it, okay? Whether they like it or not. Well, that's fine, okay? So they do what they need to, right? They learn the techniques, the skills or whatever. They get to this certain level, right? We'll call it first degree black belt, right? Because in the West, people think that a black belt's a black belt's a black belt, right? We know differently, but that's just generally how people believe, right? So, you know, he has a black belt so he can kick my ass. Well, I don't know. My curriculum is a little bit different than Japan, and I would certainly put um, any of my fifth cue up against anybody that got their black belt in six months because that guy who got his fifth cue uh, has been training for what, James, year and a half, two years, something like that. Right. So, um, anyway, <clears throat> um, but they're going to do these things, right? Well, a couple of things happen along the way, right? Um, there's processes that we work, right? Cause we learn things from our, our teachers, right? We practice 15 minutes a day, give or take, right. For every class that we attend, uh, forever or for every hour of class. Right. So, one of our routines, right? At some point during the day, right? We practice, right? Um, habits, people think that practice is a habit. Uh, practice is a routine, right? We routinely practice. What comes out of that are habits that cause us to move, act, and speak differently, to think differently, right? To engage with things differently, right? So our walking changes, right? We have a different habit that way, right? The way we move, the way we look at the world, all those kind of things, right? That's, it becomes different, right? Your habit's different, okay? A bad habit would be like chewing your nails. You end up doing it and then you realize, shit, I want to quit that, right? You're doing it before you even realize you're doing it, right? And that's what these things are as well. And people could split hairs, right? Habits, processes, but think about habits being internal, right? That are, that you own, right? It's, it's some part of you that is either, working in the direction that you want it to go uh, or you want to be going when you're not thinking about it, right? Um, or it's, you know, debilitating you, right? Whatever, okay? A process is something you consciously work, right? So when I'm practicing, right, what do I do first? What do I do next? What do I do next, okay? Um, same thing with the next one, right? What am I working on? What's my process for moving forward, right? Um, in our curriculum, uh, the process is in every module leading toward black belt, there's five of them, but in every module, there's three stages. Okay. And so the first stage is designated by somebody with a colored belt around their waist. Let's say they're in module three, module three. Um, I can't get reddish orange belts, right? Um, cause the colors of our belts actually come off of the, uh, Kongo Kai mandala, uh, and are referencing the life skills, uh, or life, uh, uh, yeah, life skills, right? Um, from that side, it wasn't just this arbitrary color thing that was made up, right? So it's pulled off of there. So first level in any module. So I'm going to use module three. There's, it's an orange belt um, <clears throat> as a reference point, but all the modules work the same way with the exception of white uh, module one because everybody starts with a white belt. Um, so that's the only one that's kind of miss. It's, it's kind of out of whack, right? But anyway... So uh, someone brand new to module three has this orange belt, but it has a white stripe running the length of it, right? 
So they and the teachers and anybody else looking to them or trying to help them, whatever, knows where they are. Okay, Somebody who's in the intermediate stages of module uh, three is wearing a solid orange belt. And anybody that's in the in the uh, review um, and preparation for graduation out to mod four. Right. They're wearing an orange belt, same color orange. Right. But it has a black stripe running through the length of it. See, we can get our heads wrapped around this because it's a micro version of the whole martial arts thing, right? White belt, solid colors, black belt, right? So it's that idea, right? Beginner, intermediate, advanced. But it's a process. So what people who have a white stripe around their waist should be doing and spending most of their time on is collecting and familiarizing themselves with the basics being done in that module. They're going to be still practicing things from previous modules. And so those things continue to get better because everything needs to be heading towards second degree black belt, which is what people get from me when I think that they can use Taijutsu and only Taijutsu, not tic-tac-toe, whatever, to defend against the average attacker on the street who's going to throw whatever they want. Okay? See, there has to be, right? So the process, my process that students inherit is getting from here to being at least able to defend against the average person on the street without having to fall back on something else, including, you know, caveman style, whatever. Right. So it's not, let me just turn this thing off. Cause I just heard my phone go and we don't need other dumb stuff to happen. Hold on one second. I apologize. Get rid of that. Hopefully that did it. Okay, so the process is there's a collecting, right, and a familiarization stage, right? So they're collecting the kamai for that module. They're collecting the new fist and the striking methods for that uh, level, the footwork for that level, the body movement skill. So in module three, it's leaping, right? It's uh, four directional. It's shiho tenchi tobi. So it's basically six directional leaping, right? Forward, back, side, side, up and down, right? And that, of course, is going to lead to hapo giri, uh, hapo tobi, right? So, uh, but they're collecting these things and they're familiarizing themselves. So when they test to go to the intermediate stage, um, what they should be able to do is demonstrate that they can attach the name to the thing, right? So they know it and they can, you know, in a, in a very slow, deliberate kind of way, show this thing, right? I'll say, show me, uh, which they actually learned in mod two, but uh, you know, so they'll show this thing, right? By mod three, they should be able to go from a fist to a fist, as opposed to mod two, just putting it together. Same thing with Shikan Ken in mod two. Mod three, by implication, has that, but they actually have this Boshi Ken, right? Shito Ken kind of thing, right? But they, now they have to be able to do these things, right? Correctly. So it handles resistance, right? Um, and it doesn't fold. So that's the improvement from previous levels. But now they're being introduced to, uh, at this level, Shitan Ken, Boshi Ken. Uh, that kind of thing, right? Four directional kicking. They learned front stomp kicking in mod two. So now they're going to add out, outside side kicking, cross side kakushigiri kicking, and rear kicking, right? Um, eventually, again, that ends up leading toward hapo giri, uh, hapo kiri. Yeah, hapo giri, right? Infinite directions, right? Um, so they're collecting, right? Then they move to the intermediate stage, and now their focus is on the dynamics, right? Flow and, and uh, well, mod three, it's direct committed action with no wind up. There's no tell. There's nothing like that, right? So they're working on timing, distancing, angling, right? Commitment, those kind of things, right? Um, they're understanding how to, how to reframe speed to go from move real fast to moving directly and cutting down the time it takes to go from point A to point B without trying to get your body to go faster than his, right? Because you're always going to run into somebody faster, right? So they're getting this stuff, and now they're going from a familiarization with techniques. They've added a couple more, 
but the techniques are smoothing out, right? So they no longer have to think about where to put their foot. They don't have to think about how the kama is made, right? They don't have to think about where the hand goes. They're, what they're doing at this phase is working on making sure that when that arm in kose is where it's supposed to be, right, it is strong, right? If it's in, a, in the wrong place, right, it's, it's going to collapse. So where to position and things like that, right? Uh, <clears throat> so they're leaping, right? Very quickly, boom, they can move from point to point, right? They're going to be combining leaping with rolling, right? Because they might land and stumble. They might land and have to drop under something, right? So they're not going to leap and then drop and then roll, right? They're able, because they, they're going to combine that with the flow and the rolling they picked up in mod two, right? So uh, that kind of stuff, right? And then moving into the third phase, right? It's two things, right? One, they're making sure that they have their techniques, right? They don't have to think about it. They can do these things. That There's a sense of confidence and comfortableness, right, with their techniques, right? They're starting to own them, right, their skills and techniques. But they're also reviewing, right? They're going through their module workbook, and they're reviewing, which reminds me, if you didn't see the little clip I put up that kind of goes through one of our module workbooks, um, check on the YouTube channel. Uh, it's one of the newest ones that's up there. But anyway, um, so they're going through the workbook, seeing if there's something that somehow they missed in class, they didn't pick it up, or they're taking stock of, yep, got that, got that, yeah, pretty comfortable with that, right? Ooh, that one needs some work, right? So they're making smaller lists, right, of things that need more attention. So there's a process, right, of collecting and uh, kind of being initiated into something, right? Uh, refining it, right, getting better with it, right, and then taking it to that next level. So here's what's going to happen during their training in those in that final two or three months, depending on how long it takes them to go through uh, that uh, that phase, right? So <clears throat> they're going to be reviewing and double checking, make sure they're missing something because they need a list for that. So when they go to class, they uh, sense I uh, I don't think I saw this one, right? Can you know, what's Okay, so can we do that in class? Great. Okay, um, this one I need more practice with, so I can do that on my own time, or I can check with Sensei. Hey, you know, will this come up in class a little bit more? Can we do this? Because I, I think I need a little bit more work with this, and I need a little bit more feedback. Okay, great. Okay, my online guys would just send me uh, review videos, right? So I can make sure that they're getting where they need to be. Okay, so then the techniques that they have. Um, we don't have to do anything with them, right? No. The process is always growth, right? So the techniques that they have, right, that the techniques that they're they're solid with, right, now we're going to give them some variations, okay, right? so they don't get stuck on only one way to do things. So here'd be a variation, here'd be another, you know, another way to do it. If he does this, do this, right? Or um, we're going to look at it from the perspective of, okay, you have that, now, if you can do this before he throws the punch, it's going to make your life even easier and your ability to execute the technique like three times better or three times easier, whatever, right? So again, there's a process, right? And we're going to work the process in module one, work the process in module two, module three, whatever, right? So if we work the process, right, along the way, habits will be developed so that, you know, we can go to Kamai without thinking about it. Defensively, we're not doing this kind of stuff. We're doing this kind of stuff, whatever, right? Then first degree black belt is a guarantee. I mean, it's a, it's a foregone conclusion because you're working the process, right? And the way things were explained to me by my teachers is that anybody willing to stick around long enough and learn what they need to learn, right, to work the process, right, um, is going to get a first degree black belt. Right. Then the next step after that is right for second degree. What we're looking at is uh, being able to, again, handle that the average attacker on the street, not the trained MMA guy or whatever, but the average average attacker who's criminal thug or uh, guy, you know, who's having an anger, an anger management problem or whatever. Right. Can you handle them? But can you handle them using Nimpo, Budo, Taijutsu, whatever you want to call it? Right alone and you don't need to mix in boxing wrestling thuggery whatever you know you, you you can use the stuff that you've learned to to go with the flow to to you know let him do what he's doing and you're able to match that and and bring things to a you know to a conclusion 
Um, so that's what it takes for somebody to get the second degree. So there's a process, right? We want to take what they've learned, and now we have to work some drills, some situational. Uh, uh, I don't like the word sparring, but that kind of thing, right? Um, we're going to change the environment around on them, right? We're going to go outside and train. We're going to do different things that insert the feel of some of those elements of a real fight, right? I know people think they're training for a real fight when they're going through the curriculum, when they're going through the Q levels and stuff like that, right? And it's cool. I mean, you know, I fantasized about that kind of stuff too, but that's not the purpose of that training. The purpose of that training is to collect tools for your toolbox so when you get to first degree, right, and the real training starts, then you've got a full toolbox and now we can pop the hood on different cars and go, here's what it, you know, whatever. Here's what this looks like on this car. Here's how it's positioned over here, blah, 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 right? So, Anyway, so again, there's a process for making that happen, right? So we can grow to that. So what I was told was, again, anybody puts in the time and learns what they need to learn can get a first degree. Anybody willing to do the work that's necessary, right, um, to, to really make the techniques and skills what they're supposed to be, right, from Shodan, right, will make it to Nidon, right? But after that, all bets are off, right? And see, this is where we're going to go with this, right? Because there's a growth, right? There's a process to get to Shodan, right? And we there's a you know a box of toys at every every level, right? But we keep working on these things, and what we're really doing is not a box of toys. It's it's more like we're exposed to different tools, and then we learn how they get used and stuff like that. And they go in our toolbox. Then we do, and every once in a while, we might have to pull one out to remind ourselves, okay, that's how that works. Put it back, that kind of thing, right? And so we can demonstrate the use of the tool uh, for first degree, right? We can grab the right tool at the right time against the right attack against somebody who's throwing stuff that we weren't given a heads up on, right? Everything leading up to Shodan, well, 80% of stuff leading up to Shodan, right, is, you know, teacher shows something, everybody goes and practices. There's a toady, there's an uke, right? And we all know what we're doing, right? Okay. It's when we take away that knowing where now there's a whole process because there has to be a mental shift, right? We have to start recognizing what kind of punch is probably going to be coming based on the way he's holding his hands, his elbows, shoulders rolled or not, heads down or not, right? Level the hands relative to the, to the plane of the shoulders, all that kind of stuff, right? How is he carrying his weight, right? Is he is he pitched in? Is he leaning back, right? What's he doing? Where are his hands? Maybe he's not a puncher at all, right? So there's a whole process where we're now not, we're still learning techniques, right? But we're more focused on assessing, right? What's the problem? So I can reach into my bag of kajutsu tricks, and pull out my onikodaki or my kosei no kamai or whatever, right? So I, I'm assessing. And so at Nidan, we're able to string our basics together in an unbroken flow against whatever he's doing, right? He gets to lead the dance until he shows me how to kick his ass. And then everything changes, okay? But again, there's a process to get the, to uh, to Shodan. There's a process to get to Nidan, Okay. We'll talk about the all bets are off here in just a minute for Sandan and above in our curriculum, okay? Because you have to remember that the way, and again, these are Hatsumi Sensei's words, not mine, right? The way Hatsumi Sensei promoted people, the stuff that I require for Nidan, and he understood that because I'm training police officers, security people. Uh, America is very different when it comes to violence than other places and whatnot, right? So people need to get things at a certain place. But the time to get there is a little bit, it's it's different, right? So what we require for Nidan, Hatsumi Sensei doesn't require until like eighth or, well, didn't require until like eighth or ninth on, okay? So it's different, right? Anyway, so, um, so again, processes, right? So it's the same thing with anything else, right? When we're learning something, right? We, we start doing it. We practice it. I don't care if it's shoe tying or uh, who knows, setting up a, a camper, whatever, right? Step one, step two, step three. Here's the process, right? And eventually we get to a point where we can just do it, right? And we don't realize that 
we're stuck in a routine until we go camping with a friend who has a different maker model and shit's not in the where it's where it is on ours. Okay. Or we, you know, we grab a different uh, firearm if, if we're doing that kind of training or, uh, you know, whatever, right. We're, we're working with somebody in the dojo or at a seminar. Right. And I forgot to bring my boken along and I get, I team up with somebody. He goes, Oh, you can use mine. Right. And next thing I know, I'm holding something that's heavier or lighter or the grip is thicker or thinner or whatever that I'm used to. And suddenly now I've got this adjustment period, right? Um, unless your process included making sure that you're using different types, right? So again, processes, right? The, if we work the process, we should be developing the habits that are necessary for being able to produce the, the results we want. But here's the thing. Habits and routines can become crutches, okay? They can become crutches, right? Here's a routine, okay? Call it a habit, call it whatever you want, but here's a routine that people have. They get up in the morning, make yourself some coffee, right? Have that, get themselves together. On the way to work, right? They get another coffee or they get it when they get to work, right? Or whatever, okay? And that's their pick-me-up, okay? Have you ever heard somebody say, oh man, it's too freaking early. I haven't had my coffee yet. You know, my joke is uh, it's too early for you, right? You haven't had your 15th cup of coffee, right? Usually I say that to people at five, six o'clock at night. So, uh, but here's this, sorry, here's this rule in engineering or it's actually like systems develop. And I don't care if that system is a human body. I don't care if it's a life. I don't care if it's a business. I don't care if it's a church. I don't care if it's a classroom. I don't care. I don't care if it's a family or a group of friends or whatever, right? It's this, it's a system, right? Everybody kind of knows where they are and what they can say or not say without triggering somebody or to make somebody happy or whatever, right? We get it, right? The way the, you know, the, the old uh, analog clocks and stuff, right? The way the gears and the levers work, cars, all that. It doesn't matter, right? The rule is no system can grow beyond its capabilities. No system can grow past its threshold. What that means is we keep doing the same thing. And this is what black belts start to recognize, right? And this is where black belts start quitting and dropping off. And sometimes they don't even have to make it to black belt for that, okay? What started off being big, humongous lessons, like I'm learning this come I, I'm learning this, this strike, I'm learning this, this technique. This is called what? Oh, say on. Okay, okay. And say on means we're all, no, we're all noise, okay? And that comes from, okay, so, and I'm learning this thing, right? Lessons are really, really big. Right. But eventually, especially getting into the black belt levels, students have seen the same techniques again and again and again. But the problem is that their process hasn't changed. So what ends up happening is they keep seeing the same techniques. So they start getting bored or what they don't recognize. Well, maybe they do recognize the tech, the, 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 the lessons go from being these big ginormous things, right? And lessons start getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, right? But what they don't understand, either because they don't intuitively get it or they, don't, they can't get their head wrapped around it, right? Or their teacher doesn't understand or their teacher doesn't have a different process for them or one to give them, right? So what they don't understand is that those the, the big lesson, right, tends to be in a vacuum, right? Like this is going to work in the dojo, but it's going to need to be adjusted for out there, right? So if I fix something in a technique, let's say I'm having a problem with things or whatever, and I fix something in that technique to beginners, to new people, to people in that pre-need-on down level, if I fix something, then I've, I've only fixed the technique or I fixed that part of the technique, right? But as the, as the lessons get smaller and smaller and smaller, they get more significant 
And so if I discover this one little nugget that's being used in a particular technique or in a particular context, it's probably not a physical move, could be, but more likely it's a tactic or a strategy, right? So if I fix that, then any technique or any scenario or any situation that has that, I will have fixed that far into the future. I, right? I, I end up little, little lessons, fix things globally instead of just in the technique they're in. But people can get conditioned to new toys, new techniques, new skills, big lessons, right? Get those, get those. Okay, got those. Next set. New toys, new techniques, new lessons. Work on those. Okay, next, right? And then they hit the black belt levels and it's not fun anymore because there's no big lessons. So one of two things happen. The first thing is either a, a transition or a transformation takes place and they take their head off the big lessons and start recognizing these little lessons. Holy cow. That's like, that's like gold right there. Right. Or they think they made it. Right. They think they made it. Got it. Right. Got it. So they start to stop training or they take a instructor's role. And so they spend all their time teaching and they spend less and less, if any time, actually training and practicing to get better. Because the assumption is what? They got it, right? So in that instance, one of two things happens. Either they stay and their role changes, now they're an instructor, and they're just regurgitating the same stuff over and over again, right? And no growth is happening, right? Um, not skill-wise anyway, right? They might start to grow as a teacher or whatever, but growth skill wise ability to produce results with the lessons learned and all that 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 hits a hits a bottleneck not that it, not that it doesn't serve them right but it can only go so far right for those of you listening audio only that's me pounding my hand up against another hand like I'm hitting a ceiling right so or they figure that they made it and they quit right and if they're if they quit two things can happen right they're either done and go through the rest of their lives telling everybody, oh, I earned a black belt in so-and-so martial art and whatever. And unless somebody says, oh, hey, can you show me something? Where they would have to admit that they long since forgot it, right? They're, they're, they're golden, right? It's all good, right? Or they go jump into another martial art and start at the beginning again, which provides what? Big lessons, right? So they get their big lesson fix. Okay, but the process should be moving to where little variables start to change. And if we can get more and more control of these things, then our abilities change. Right. But the process has to change. Just like a weak man can become strong by doing things that make strength occur. Right. But a strong man cannot become stronger. Women, you too, can't become stronger by doing the same thing. They have to change their routine. Right? They have to change what they're doing so the ceiling moves. Okay? Same thing for us. So when my teacher said, anybody can make a shodan, anybody willing to work hard enough can make it to nidan, after that, all bets are off. It's because after that point, and again, if you're going through the Bujinkan system, then it's eighth or ninth on, Right? After that, the way you look at things have to change. Yourself, others, the world, the connection between them, how things work, right? We have to question everything, right? It's not comfortable for a lot of people. Um, what else has to happen? Um, what human beings are capable of, all those kind of things. There's just a wide array of things, right? So, even though we give more techniques for somebody who's going from second degree to third degree, any monkey can do the techniques, right? Any monkey with Shodan skill or a little bit better than that, right, can duplicate other kata. 
but are you able to do the things that are inside? Right? I'll give you, for instance, in the Kuki Shinden school, uh, Hanbo Jutsu, right? And remember, Hanbo, uh, we're going to be covering this in our fall camp coming up here pretty soon. We're going to be uh, looking at the, the Nijino Hachimon, right, from ancient Japan, the eight gates of training that had to be going on for anybody to say that they were actually doing ninjutsu, right? We're going to bring that in the 21st century. That doesn't mean that we're changing shit and, and doing things drastically different, but we do have to recognize certain truths. One of those truths is that on the Nijino Hachimon, right, one of the eight gates is Sol Jutsu, right? Some people would say Yari Jutsu, right? Spear, okay? It's called Sol Jutsu. Um, Sol is not another name for Yari. Okay? Yari means spear. Okay. Soul means monk. Okay. There's a whole block of study for you to follow. Okay. To understand why that's why our art is not called or our art doesn't call spear work yari jutsu like a lot of other arts do. Why we call it sojutsu. There's a connection with a really, really old spiritual tradition. Anyway. Okay. Anyway. So uh, so what is what is yari, right? Well, yadi requires a bow skill, and it requires sword skill, blade skill, because you're putting a blade on the end of a long pole, and you're going to be cutting out at a distance, right? So, you know, spear, halberd, that kind of stuff, right? Hanbo were on a list of techniques that were for what-if situations, Okay. Nobody would go out in the freaking battlefield with a three foot stick or a four or five foot stick, Joe, right? Or a bow even, right? When, you know, a seven, eight, nine foot halberd or spear or whatever is going to serve you better, right? I can tag this guy from out there. Why would I go with a, go out there with a three foot stick when the sword that the other guy is carrying depending on the time in history, right? If he only has a katana, we're looking at what? A 26 to 31 inch blade, not counting Tsuka, right? His, his weapon's longer than my weapon, right? My ability to get to his hands is going to be, why would I do that to myself, right? Um, if we're talking Kamakura era or before, now he's got a dachi, big ass sword, right? Okay. That's not what it literally translates to, but pretty close. Right. So, so anyway. Right. So Hambo or Joe. Uh, no. Right. So this was on a category of techniques called what if. Right. Not literally called what if, but you get the idea. Right. Because what if my long weapon gets cut. Right. In the process of this battle, it gets cut by one of these guys with this long, sharp knife. Right. Where is it getting cut? If it gets cut, you know, pretty close to the working end, that blade, now I've got bojutsu, right? If it gets cut farther down, now I've got jojutsu. If it gets cut farther down, if it gets cut, so we've got stuff smaller and smaller too, right? Because I now have an oh shit moment because this thing got cut. Here he comes, right? I may only do this technique for half of three, four seconds, finish that off so I can drop that, pick up another blade off the ground because... See, the rule of ammunition and weapons on a battlefield is um, carry food and medical supplies. Okay? Food and medical supplies are going to be in a shortage on the battlefield. Ammunition and weapons, it's going to be all over the place. Learned that from my first uh, uh, squad leader after I left basic training and went to uh, Korea. And uh, he was, you know, his freaking duffel bag is like, half collapsed and mine stuff because it's got everything in there that regulation said was supposed to be in there. He's not putting that shit in there. You think you have time for a bath or a shower or whatever, let alone wiping your ass after you take a poop, right? He didn't say poop, but um, we don't need YouTube really getting that down on us, right? So um, he said, I said, well, what's, what's all the extra space for? He goes, food, right? Food's going to be at a premium. And if I can get some medical supplies, that's going in there too. I said, what about ammunition? He goes, fuck ammunition. When you drop, I'm taking yours. The ammunition's going to be laying all over the place. Now, for a young buck private who just got out of basic training, that was quite the punch to the gut. But it was a reality check. Okay. So anyway, I dis, you know, finish this guy off. I'm not going to be running around the battlefield with a damn Hanbo just because it worked for half a second. 
I'm going to toss it, pick up another one that's laying around. They're all over the damn place or pull out something else that I have that's going to give me that advantage or at the very least neutralize hits. Okay. So it was in a what if category. In today's world, <laughs> try walking around the streets of your town with a spear or a halberd and see how long it takes for the guys with the guns to show up. Right. So, right. What are the common things today when it comes to mid range or pole weapons? Canes, right? Rakes, garden implements, push brooms, whatever. Right. So, I mean, if you have a pull cue laying around, if you have a big old two by four that you can grab or whatever, but see the long weapon in today's world is now the what if and the what if from ancient Japan is now the common item. Right? Everything has changed, even though nothing has changed. The principles and concepts have not changed. What the principles and concepts look like has changed. I just gave you a for instance as to why third degree and above training is different. It's no longer just memorizing techniques. You have to understand what's behind them. And that's why my teachers always said, all bets are off. Okay? Because people, people don't understand that, one, the process is only designed to get you to a certain place. Okay? One of the analogies I give people is, um, let's say I go to a furniture store and I buy a brand new living room suit, right? Couch, love seat chair, ottoman, entertainment center, TV, whatever, right? So here's delivery day, right? Truck pulls up to my house and now what? They're not driving the truck through the front door and parking in the living room. And then we're going to climb up onto the truck and sit around in the furniture, right? But that's how people treat martial arts up to a certain point, right? And it does work that way, right? But your kata, your kamai, your lessons at a certain point become delivery trucks, not the point of the lesson. They're the delivery vehicle bringing the lesson, right? So now there's a different process for getting that stuff out of the truck and into the living room, okay? So even if you were just going home, you drive your car or ride your bike or whatever to the house, but you don't use the car or the bike or whatever to enter the house. There's a key right? There's a thing to open it, da, 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 right? Our training needs to be like that, okay? If we keep using the other process, you hit a ceiling, just like the delivery truck. Pulls up. Hey, where do you want this stuff? I just park it there. How much do you want for the truck? <laughs> no, right? Okay. So th there's always that question, what's next, okay? Uh, here's another example of how bottlenecks get created or crutches get created because what ends up happening again go back if, if you're so inclined read that that uh, chapter on the three lords of uh, ego in uh, cutting through spiritual material materialism by chogyan trungpa um, we'll try to remember to post that if you're on facebook down in the comment area so that you can spell it correctly during your uh, youtube search or whatever right um but uh so people, have, let's go back and use the coffee analogy, right? People have coffee or some kind of thing, right? One of my guys on my, on my business team, uh, he's my IT and social media guy, right? Oh, the number of freaking um, rocket jet fuel things to keep his ass on fire, right? Um, Drew, you know, I'm talking to you if you're listening, right? Um, it's just, oh my God, right? What's the stuff called? Like throttle and all these other names that mean like, you know, I just drank, you know, JP4 or whatever. And right. Just don't light a match. Um, so. Caffeine's a stimulant. Right. Or these things have these different things. Right. Uh, dark chocolate has uh, what is it? The alumine or something like that. Right. Um, it operates like caffeine, but it's, <laughs> it will make your heart collapse. Right. But anyway, right. So it's a stimulant, right. And it's used as a pick me up. Okay. Fantastic. But what ends up happening is if we keep doing it, right. If we keep running, that becomes the process that every morning I use that to get up and going. What ends up happening is it becomes a crutch 
And a crutch is something that you can't get around very well without, right? So instead of a crutch helping the physical therapy so that I can stand on my own two feet and, and get back to normal, right? We can rely on the crutch so much that now the musculature grows differently and we have a hard time getting around without a crutch or a cane or a walker or whatever, right? Same thing with coffee. Okay. And again, I'm just picking coffee, right? It's whatever habit or process we have to run, right? I remember back in the day, probably early to mid eighties, somebody admitted in an article on, uh, I almost said online in a magazine, right? One of these old archaic things, right? Okay. That if they didn't start all their defenses with the same technique, they were completely lost. So they weren't learning anything. They learned this thing. And so, you know, but with coffee, stimulant, whatever, right? It only works so long. And what ends up happening is your body hits a plateau. But you didn't just hit a plateau where the caffeine's not helping, right? So it's not one cup. It's now two cups or three cups or a cup in the morning, cup at lunch or whatever, right? It becomes the thing that's needed to get to normal. So instead of being normal and, man, I got like a couple other things I need to do here. I need to jumpstart the system and give myself a little bit of kick, right? Instead of it being that, I can't function unless I ingest this stuff that gives me the kick. I'm not knocking coffee, right? I drink coffee. Every once in a while, right? Some days I have several cups. Some days I have zero, right? And it doesn't affect me one way or the other, okay? Um, I just know when I'm a little bit tired because I, I was pulling a 3.30 a.m. kind of thing, working on things and whatnot, and I'm going to be back up at 6.45. Mm, at a certain point in the, during the day, I don't treat myself to a siesta, so I need a kick, right? But I don't condition myself so that, Without the kick, I can't be normal. Okay? But again, we have to understand that every process is designed or should be designed to produce the habit patterns that are needed to produce the results on, auto, on autopilot. Okay? So a process, in effect, is a crutch. but you keep working it until you don't need it anymore. Okay. How do you know you don't need it? Cause somebody flinched at me and said, boo. And I shifted in something that was very come. I like, right. Oh, okay. Things are in, in muscle memory. Right. But if we hit the ceiling, what ends up happening is we get jammed up, right? We can't grow past that. And here's what happens for a lot of folks and maybe you can relate to this um, instead, because some of you are just getting started, right? You're interested, you, you're getting started. For some of you, you're training, but you keep doing the same techniques, the same way, right? Whatever. And it's just practicing to maintain skill. That's not growth, right? You're in a maintenance mode for however long that's been, okay? And if you're not running the process correctly, what could be happening is you pull out things, maybe pull out a staff or a sword or whatever, right? And, you know, I mean, how would you know unless you had somebody that knew what they were looking at, right? Um, you're making the same mistakes that you made when you were a different belt color or you uh, have to remind yourself, oh crap, I forgot that move or, uh, you know, whatever, right. You have to remind yourself, oh, don't forget bend knees. If you have to remind yourself, then the habit's not there. Okay. So what processes produce the habits that we want to have when we're on autopilot and not thinking about how to do something. Okay. And processes are our crutch. But for some of you, you hit a point where, for whatever reason, and you might have to look back because you might have attributed blame to something, 
life condition, person, whatever, right? When really it might have been training looked like the same shit different day. Wasn't fun no more. Lessons weren't big. They weren't obvious anymore. Whatever. Okay. So, but either way, right? And now you're trying to restart, but you're trying to restart as though you were brand new, running the same processes that you ran to get you where you are. And yes, maybe your skills got a little rusty or whatever, right? But they're only going to need to be like worked a little bit to get them back, right? Because they're in there. Okay. They're in there. They'll, they'll come back fairly quickly. Ask James, ask any of my guys that for whatever reason, right, took some time off, come back and James, I'm going to fire you up here for a minute. Not fire you up. Right? So uh, it was like a couple of weeks, a couple of months before like everything that you had worked on prior was back up to serviceable thing, right? Things that you had forgotten, but that didn't take very long at all. Right. So right. It, it's not a matter of restarting and you can't work the same processes. And I, what, what's happening for a lot of folks and they can't see it. Right. Because you can't see it from where you are. Right. It's really, really difficult to be wise when you're inside the problem. OK. See, I remember one time <laughs> I was uh, I was in the military. We were flying family back from uh, Germany to visit family. And uh, like we were taking the space available kind of thing. It was it was a decent plane. Right. It wasn't like I was putting my family in like, uh, you know, airborne jump seats and stuff and a cargo plane or whatever. Right. Um, but we're having a hard time because it was two kids and my wife and me and whatever. Right. And they didn't have like enough space. And like I let two flights go by and I'm getting agitated because this is eating into my leave time. Right. And somebody leans over and goes, um, your, how old's your daughter? Like 18 months. You know, she doesn't need to see, right? I mean, she can just sit on a lap. On a lap. Shit. <laughs> but I couldn't think about that because in my head, I needed four seats. Even though at 18 months, we couldn't have freaking strapped her into an airplane seat to save our butt because there was no car seat uh, rules or anything like that. They didn't have anything like that. But somehow in my head, we got four people. I need four seats, right? So we can get that way all the time. And what can happen is we can be trying to run old processes that are supposed to develop habits or skills or whatever, but we already have them. They're rusty. We're not sure if we remember or whatever, but we just, we need a slightly different process. I call them bridge processes, right? That kind of toss you into things for a couple of three, four classes, three, four months, whatever. And next thing you know, shit, you thought you long since forgot is bubbling to the surface and it's coming out. Great. Right. James is nodding his head. Yes. Okay. And then now we work a different process because of growth, right? Because it's all about growth. Remember, only the first level, my, my belt systems and the modules and the way what I require from each of my students as they move through those three phases in each module, right, is based on a natural growth process. It's about skill proficiency, not just learning skills. It's about technique proficiency, not just learning techniques, right? It's all about growth. So if we're not growing, we're what? We're dying. Right. So uh, old wise people long before me said that stuff, not me. Right. So and we're all dying anyway, whether you're growing or not. So uh, I guess it's going to depend on how you die. <laughs> so anyway, and that that's that's the point. So, again, you know, if you've settled into a spot and you're happy with that, then great. I would consider you to be a success. As long as there isn't this voice in the back of your head gnawing. But I also have to ask, if you're okay with where you are and you're not looking to grow, why the hell are you watching a podcast like this? Or why are you listening to a podcast like this? Because this is about growth. 
This is about change. This is about mastery. Okay? Maybe just like, I don't know, the sound of my voice. Who knows? Right? <laughs> so, right? Um, if, if, if that's you, that's, that's great, right? If you just like the idea of training, right? It's, I'm moving and I'm just kind of keeping the body things. I'm not really looking for mastery and whatnot. Um, it's just, you know, I'm keeping an art alive at whatever level, you know, I can do. Then, okay, that's great, right? But if you're growth oriented, you're going to have to, at some point, ask yourself, like, is what I'm doing like moving me forward. And that's, that's the thing with all of these, right? Cause uh, the title of this episode was what routines, habits, or was it habits and routines, whatever. Right. And crutches and crutches. I put in print uh, quotation marks and, and a question mark. Right. So processes are crutches to get you to a certain point. Right. But if we keep, if we hold on to that, that can become a crutch. Just like coffee can become a crutch, right? Meditation can become a crutch, right? Whatever, right? Whatever that thing is that we need, right? Whatever things we add after the words, I am. I am lousy at math. I am uh, too stupid to understand that. I am stuck because of wife, job, whatever. I am whatever. Okay, your subconscious loves that, loves the words I am. Be careful what comes after the words I am. Right? You might want to change that to something like, um, at the moment, I have a tendency toward. At the moment, I have a tendency to get flustered in the face of math problems. At the moment, uh, I'm having uh, some struggles with managing time and availability to practice, whatever, right? But I am not able to practice. I am, uh, you know, whatever, right? I'm broke. I'm poor. I'm being held down by the man. I'm being what I don't give a shit what it is. Okay. Because when you use phrases like that, then you, you, you don't need to worry about anybody else, right? You've created the ceiling, right? No growth can happen in that area because you've created the ceiling. You've stated to your subconscious, I am. And ego grabs a hold of that, right? I am happy where I am. Great. Okay. Say that often enough. You might be. Okay. But again, it's the process. So let's go back to the curriculum, right? Anybody can get a show done. Anybody who's willing to do the work, right, can get a need on. The all bets are off is because the process has to change. Okay. And I learned a long time ago that martial artists are really high on the scale when it comes to like physical things, when it comes to judgment, like perceptions, right? Right, wrong, good, bad, those kind of things, right? And conceptualizations. Okay. Like they can imagine things, right? Fantasize about being super cool warrior, protector, whatever, or whatever, right? They're really good with conceptualization, right? That's, you know, martial artists, people that are that inclined, right? Will learn stuff and then make up their own thing, right? So they're really high in those levels. Where they're low is in the feeling department. And I don't mean emotions. I mean, being able to navigate and steer correctly in the face of things that are pleasant and will draw me in, right? So critical, this really requires critical thinking skills or things that are not so pleasant. And so the reverse, and I want to stay away from them or that they're neutral, right? The critical faculty, the intellect kind of thing that's needed for that, not so much, right? And then consciousness, right? To be able to observe themselves and bigger processes, right? Not so high, right? So those things have to be worked on so that we can we can navigate some of these other areas in life. Okay? So, uh, you know, up to need on people tend to be style oriented. Right. So unless they quit that style or add another one, 
right? To add other capabilities, right? They're style oriented, right? So now they're going to get fixed on whatever, okay? Um, going beyond that, we need to be problem solution oriented and we need to be tactical and strategic minded, right? So what's the best, easiest way to navigate this problem, to solve this problem with the least amount of wear and tear on myself, but also with the least amount of work involved, right? Most people can relate to that. Human beings tend toward lazy as well, right? Yeah. Most people say that, um, uh, what is it? Uh, frustration is the mother of invention. Is that what it is? Yeah, no, I don't think so. I think it's laziness. What can I do to make this happen easier? But that's not that doesn't have to be a problem. Okay, it doesn't have to be a problem. Here's where all this was heading. Okay, the question, the intellect part that gets injected into which process to use. Is this the right one? Is it working? Uh, am I developing the right habits? Should I be doing this? Uh, is this the right time or whatever? Is, is this serving to move me in the direction I want to be going? See, these are all higher level lessons. The style oriented person, it showed on, even at need on, the question is, is this right? Am I doing it right? Right. Signs on and above, you get your feedback from the world. Right. Not other people telling you you're doing it right or whatever. It's, am I producing the results I set out to produce? If not, what needs to change? And, and how much? Okay. So habits, developing habits, good or bad? Depends on the habit. What are you trying to accomplish? Processes or routines, good or bad? Like, I have a routine, right? I take a shower. Not that you need to envision that, right? Taking a shower, I always go from head down, okay? That way, at the end of this thing, I know that I've covered everything because it's the same routine, right? Because I'm an A personality type who leans toward ADD, so I'm just, like, always going, right? But it's that A personality type where I feel like when I'm taking a shower that I'm wasting time that I could be producing other results with because it's an everyday mundane thing. Okay? Does that mean I don't want to be clean? No, of course not. That's why I'm in the damn shower. Okay? But I tend to multitask. So I use a routine to habitually wash everything the same way so it's all done. Okay? But... To not be trapped, because if I'm always running routines and I'm always being led by habits, then I run the risk of dull sleepwalk kind of living, right? My wife and I had this little debate going, right? I want to find a manual transmission car. I miss the stick shift. I miss that driving experience and all that. But in all reality, somebody who's driving a manual uh, transmission has to be more awake at the wheel and has to be more in tune with what's going on. And their consciousness has to be covering more things than somebody who's driving automatic. You will never, never, ever, ever, because I'm not going to live that long, right? I mean, I'm going to live a long time, but the way things are being developed, I'm not going to live that long till that's the only thing on the road, but you will never find me behind the wheel of a self-driving car. If they can hack my damn cell phone. You don't get to, hack me at 60 miles an hour. But that's not the point. The point is, I'm just going to sit there and do something else while life happens around me. No. Okay. But she likes automatic. She sets her like, it's not just she has an automatic transmission. The, the headlights are on the automatic setting. The, the, anything that can be set for automatic, she has it on automatic, which is really funny because my wife's ADD. Why the hell would you do that to yourself? Right. Um, but me, 
I have an automatic transmission, but I turn my headlights on and off, all that stuff, right? Because the more that I can be paying attention to the process and awake. So let's go back to the shower. Every once in a while, right? I do, I take my shower and I do the cleaning out of order. Because it wakes your brain up. Okay. I change the process to wake things up so that I don't fall into this routine of not being able to see any other way. Okay. Because everything else is, okay. I've tried everything. Well, obviously not. Because other people are producing results and you're not. So you either tried what they are doing for like a microsecond or you haven't tried that at all. All right. So. So before we open this up to questions or whatever else is going on, uh, I'll finish this up with one story, uh, which is just the, you know, again, the question is, is it serving me? Okay. Are the habits you're developing the habits that are necessary that have to be owned by the alternate you that produces the results that you want to be producing are the processes that you're running, right? Are they producing the habits that you want to have, the skill sets, the skill proficiency? And I define skill and skill proficiency differently. Anybody can learn a skill. Skill proficiency is being able to do that so well under pressure that you don't have to think about it. You just adapt to whatever's going on and it just comes out. Okay. Uh, James, when was the last time you had to think about um, how, to, how to make a drill work? <laughs> don't know. <laughs> but your brain locks up for half a second as soon as you go click, click, and nothing happens. Right. <laughs> right. But what's the process? Oh, uh, Check let's make sure it's plugged in. Right. Or whatever it is. For some people, it's like, is there a lock on the trigger? Like, mm -hmm. is, did that go as far as it's supposed to go? Is it plugged in? Then you're going to trace it back to breaker because I need electricity. Right. There's a process to figure right. that out because you know how the thing works. Right. And what's necessary for it to work. I don't need to be able to build one. I don't need to be able to make one of those little dynamos or electromagnets or whatever that's in the in the little motor and stuff. I don't need any of that stuff. Right. I need to know how it functions. Right. So, but anyway, uh, I, uh, I was with a teacher actually, um, this ended up happening to one of my students, took one of my students to uh, a seminar with one of my teachers. This was way back in like the mid eighties, maybe late eighties at the, at the, yeah, maybe late eighties. Where were some of you guys in the late eighties? Anyway, um, <laughs> So uh, we went to the seminar and we walk up. Uh, it was during one of the breaks. I, I don't, maybe it was before we even got started with training. I go walking up to introduce a couple of my students. And there's this one student. And he's just, you know, I look over and he's just, I look in his eyes and he's just starstruck. Right. And shakes my teacher's hands. And there's this like kid in a candy store look. Right. And he says, Oh my God, I've been, I, I've been wanting to, to meet you um, for my entire life. Right. And this kind of thing was discussed a lot, right. <laughs> when our training and um, not the, not that situation, right. This, I wanted to do that. I would give anything to do that, whatever those kind of statements. Right. And my teacher looks at me and he winks and looks back at my student. And he goes, obviously not. Right. So anyway, it's not a knock on him because you know what? That student's still training. So um, that's sometimes it's one of those little wake up call kind of things. Um, some people end up quitting after things like that because they, they don't like where it went. Right. He was mean to me. Broke my Virginia. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know. Before you go wandering around and, and, and accepting that the ceiling is the ceiling or whatever, you have to ask yourself, are the processes that I'm running 
actually designed for growth or are they designed for maintaining where I am? Or are they designed for avoiding that? Right? I say I want it, but the process I'm working, like walking the walk in the door, coming home from work, right? And immediately I let myself feel tired if I didn't do it in the car on the way home, right? I just let my muscles relax a little bit, right? And I go through this process of thinking, feeling, oh, tired. I get it. I know what that feels like. Right? I also know that you can change it, okay? So, and then I think, oh, I really should train. Hear the, hear the vocal tone? Oh, I really should train. I really should practice. Okay? Not like, okay, I really need to practice. Okay? It's a completely different statement. Okay? And then we think about all the things that are probably not make the practices as successful or why today's not a good day or whatever. And next thing you know, we're running the process of binge watching Netflix or whatever it is that we're doing. Right. So, um, and for some of you, you might be already, you know, training and working, but the question is always not our habits good, not our routines good or bad, right? Um, when are they a crutch? When are they not? Right? It's a question. And that's one of the most significant things I learned in our Mikyo and our Ninpo Mikyo training is that enlightenment does not come from answers. Enlightenment comes from questions. And it, they come from the quality of the question. Right? And this one's a simple one. Is this thing that I'm doing, is this or does this belief about myself, about others, about my limitations, about constraints or whatever, are they serving me? I mean, ultimately, they're always serving you, right? Because there's a payoff to do everything. Procrastination has a payoff, right? Getting drunk has a payoff, Right. Are they moving you in the direction of the new you or the alternate you that you can see in your head doing cool shit? That's it. That's all I got. <laughs> uh, James, you have anything to throw on top of this? You're, you're working the process. Every one of my... my co-hosts or helpers or whatever with these things, with the exception of a couple of episodes where I realized that the process I was running was not allowing me to, to, to do this the way I needed to. So I reached out to James. But before that, I had Eric White. Um, he was, I was called him Radio God because he was a radio uh, personality. He was a DJ. And we had access to his radio, the radio station he worked for on Sundays. And we would go in and record anywhere between one and three episodes. But that, that's when they were all pre-recorded and all that. But we did them like a morning talk show kind of thing. So, but anyway, right? So, do you have anything to throw, throw on top of this that would be helpful to other people? Well, not really right now. I was listening along, making mental notes myself. So, <laughs> hmm. fair enough. Okay. So that being said, uh, I've seen we've had people come and go and all that kind of stuff. So any questions, comments, anything that, that I can handle? Um, I saw Jimmy come in. I saw a little notification popped up. So hi, Jimmy. Right. Um, I just don't break my flow when I'm when I'm teaching. Right. I'm not the guy that goes squirrel. Right. So. <laughs> okay. Which is a habit. Right. You have to run a different process and catch yourself doing the thing you no longer want to be doing and replace it with the thing you do want to be doing, that's going to take some time. And then over time, you'll run the thought pattern in your head before it comes out of your mouth or your body. And then eventually what ends up happening is the new thing takes over. And if you've ever changed a habit, if you've ever developed a skill, and then, I mean, it, it became the new thing, right? And then you tried to recreate the old mistake and like, you couldn't do it, right? It was just, how was I even able to do that, right? Um, at a certain stage, especially if you're teaching, uh, you need to get to a stage where 
and this comes with with really having a handle on your taijutsu because it's body skill mastery, right? Um, where you can not only do things the right way that you want to be doing and and producing, right? But you can also duplicate the mistakes. So you get past that not being able to do it to where even the mistake becomes an option. Well, Sensei, when the hell, why would I want to make a mistake? Why would I want to do it the wrong way? Well, how will students in class recognize it if you can't reflect it and they can go, oh, shit, I do that. Right. Because some people, if you're just talking about it, they can't process that. They can't turn that into pictures. Right. And if we're working our Henso Jutsu, disguise and impersonation skills. How can you make your persona look right if you can't do the limp or the the walking that everybody else does or whatever? Right. So. Even the mistakes, and this is what we mean by third down and above stuff, all bets are off. Even mistakes become the right answers in the right context, but I need assessment skills and discernment mindset, knowing what's right and appropriate in this given moment, and I'm not a slave to my own routines and habits, which have become crutches. And I know that because I watch people argue about different crutches. It's really funny because they're both producing results, but they're arguing over which way is the right way when they're both producing results. Huh. Interesting. Anyway, anybody, anything? Uh, a couple comments. Paula Miller says, well, then I'm well awake. They are always changing my computer programs. I'm a, and I'm enjoying this very interesting. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome. Is that the same Paula Miller that used to be my sister-in-law? She'll answer at some point. I had a sister-in-law named Paula Miller. And if it is, then she's a stalker. So. (laughs) (laughs) And Philip Jones said, good evening. I have no questions, but I always enjoy these episodes. Philip, 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 Philip. Fantastic. I'm glad I can be of help. And she says yes. Well, then she is a stalker. (laughs) And since I'm an ex-brother-in-law, she should ignore everything I just said because I can't possibly be um, this smart. So, (laughs) you know, nobody in your family ever thinks that you're, I mean, even Jesus said it, right? Um, uh, Not Jesus said it. Uh, You know, back in the day, people often had their last names uh, because of the, vocation that they had, the skill, whatever, right? Carpenter, Miller, whatever, right? Or from the town, right? Which is like in German, they still have that thing, right? Um, uh, Eric von Bootsbach or whatever, right? Von means from, right? So they would have those kind of things, right? So it's in the Bible, right? And um, For those who now question, so he's a, wait, I thought he was a Mikio priest and a Buddhist and but yeah because I read stuff and <laughs> read four or five different versions of the Bible so um, from cover to cover right um, when people would say you know where's this guy from and they would go to Nazareth oh can anything good come from there right so coming up through the ranks with one of my teachers we used to call things like that uh, the Jesus syndrome right? Uh, and at one point he was telling the story where, uh, he, you know, he was set up just outside of Dayton, Ohio, right? This was Stephen Hayes way, way back in the day. He was set up outside of Dayton, Ohio. And a couple of my peers, a couple of my, uh, uh, fellow students were Dayton police officers. Well, they were always trying to get him in to do, uh, police training for the Dayton police department. Right. And meanwhile, like the Dayton police department was bringing in specialists from like Houston, or LA or whatever. And every once in a while, you know, these guys would go and say, look, he's right here, man. He's an international. Da, da, da. Well, he's, he's from Dayton. He's from Germantown. Can you be that great coming from Germantown? Right. It's the same thing. Right. Meanwhile, the Houston police department has a butt ton of like experts and guys that know what they're doing down there. They were hiring Stephen Hayes to come down and teach the police. So 
right? Because somehow, and if you listen to the words that come out of your mouth about the town or region or area that you live, you might catch yourself saying, well, what can you expect from a place like this? Because, you know, the magic's always going to be somewhere else. People used to ask me that. I remember back uh, when I first set up in this area, so we're talking late late 80s, early 90s, and uh, they'd find out that I'm doing this stuff, training with Stephen Hayes and training with Hatsumi Sensei and stuff, and they're like, really? What the hell are you doing around here? I mean, you should be in, like, Houston, L.A., New York, whatever. And I'm like, no, 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 no. This is needed to. This stuff has been hard to find for centuries. Why the hell would I change that? See, it's just a realignment. Right? Experts have to come from somewhere. Why not you from the place you are? Maybe one of the bottlenecks, maybe one of the ceilings, is your belief that nobody from where you're from, including you by implication, can get farther than the ceiling. I've been a guest lecturer in universities in Texas. I've been to Nissan North American headquarters to uh, work with their VPs of manufacturing and their secure, the head of security for the entire uh, Nissan North America kind of thing or whatever, because I've got something to offer. And it didn't take a sales pitch. I'm not ringing my own bell. It's just that I can't. I mean, wherever I'm from, right? If I, if I did what everybody else does, wherever I'm from is suddenly not going to be good enough because, well, you know, really, hmm, interesting. Anyway. Anybody else? Anything else? Uh, Paula just said, no stalker, just periodically tune in. I enjoy listening and learning new things. You are a good teacher. And I'm going to keep pushing buttons. So thank you for the validation. You know how much I need it. <laughs> Thanks, Paula. I appreciate it. See, there you go. Look, see, validation from uh, somebody who doesn't even have to like me anymore because she's an ex. <laughs> Sensei's an ass. Yeah, so much for that. <laughs> All right. Is that it, James? Anything else? No? All right. So, cool. All right. So, uh, James and I are working on a whole bunch of things, uh, getting some other stuff going on. The offer's still open for some of you who are looking to get back on track. Um, no, you don't have to start all over again or whatever. Um, we can schedule uh, a call, discuss some things, which reminds me, I've got to get back to Mr. Canada. Um, uh, There's somebody that contacted us from Canada, I think, um, and get him on the schedule. I've just been tied up with uh, fire things again. Um, my house is still being put back to where it was supposed to be. Um, I spent my entire morning taking pictures because a, an inspector couldn't make it. And the option I had was rescheduled for a small pocket of time when I was going to be tied up with classes today and I had nobody to cover, or I could go take the pictures myself and send them to them. So, um, do what you got to do, I guess. Right. So anyway, um, but I have time on my schedule. Um, uh, just got to find these little pockets of time, uh, just on with a former student, from where's he from kansas city i think right um we're looking at a broader self-defense kind of thing uh, i'm not sure what my what my involvement or how deep that's going to go uh, but he's starting up this big thing uh, that's about self-protection but not or self-protection and self-defense and security and things like that but not just from a fighting standpoint but financial relationship wise, you know, the whole life kind of thing. There's all these different aspects, right? Can you survive bad things that happen in certain areas of your, of your life, right? Self-defense transcends getting punched in the face or getting stabbed or shot. Okay. Well, everybody's focused on that. Meanwhile, they're pissed off every day because of other choices or other situations or whatever. Okay. Self-protection, 
right? Protection of the self, right? Not just not getting your body broken or your skin perforated or whatever. It's just such a limited viewpoint. But again, ceilings, right? Bottlenecks, right? So anything else? Nothing else came in, but we got fall camp coming up. We do. Fall camp is September 30th, October 1st and 2nd. There's a virtual option. There's a live option. Uh, if you take it, check out the information and, you know, you can't make the full weekend or whatever, right? You can always do a day. You can do a single session. You can pay for a single day because it's more expensive if you do a session. Uh, a session is more expensive than uh, uh, what? A session. Uh, not more expensive than a single day, but if you put two sessions together, it would be more, more expensive than the two sessions in a single day. But if somebody can't do like a one single day, they could do like Saturday morning and Sunday afternoon, right? We would just charge you for a single day. That way it's just easier on you, right? Um, there are payment plans available if you need that kind of thing. Um, what else? Uh, it'll, it'll be closer. Somebody just sent me an email yesterday, I think, that they have to work so they can't even do the uh, virtual thing, but uh, they want to know if I would be uh, making the, the videos available. So yes, we will, but I'm not going to do that until closer to uh, that time. Because again, if people are in the habit of taking the easier route and getting the video so they at least have the information, right? What are the chances that they're going to do a whole lot with it. I don't know. But my job is to make sure that people are actually getting the stuff. And so my processes make people uncomfortable to the point where they have to, they have to decide whether they're going to act or not act. Not take the least discomfortable or the least uncomfortable option. All right. So... I never had that option. This is an old guy speaking again. I didn't have that option because right? things weren't recorded, right? <laughs> they weren't virtual, right? So my option was, do I figure out how to make it happen so I can be there or do I miss out on the information and hope to God that they cover it that way again in the future? Right? That... That kind of thinking, well, they'll teach that again, right, is technique oriented. What about all the other life things and the, the stories and the, and the other things that are based on students who are there and the questions that they ask and how that caused the lesson to steer in a certain direction? That'll never be duplicated again, ever. So I was always, uh, I was always hungry. Like if you think, think of you know, tigers or lions or whatever out on the, out on the, the plains. Right. I was always, always hungry because I was always afraid I was going to miss something. I was going to miss a lesson that I absolutely needed. Right. So I, I figured it out. Shit. I got loans, short-term loans, I paid them back, payroll deduction, stuff like that. Right. Negotiated with family, negotiated with, with, uh, well, I was there. You, no one, has a harder time negotiating for time off than I did when I was a low-ranking person in the Army. Zero. <laughs> right? So, and I'm going to leave country on top of it, and I'm a Cold War soldier in a country where terrorists are blowing shit up left and right. Oh, yeah. Can I get a weekend off? Can I take a week off? Yeah. Yeah. No. It'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. But... Uh, but that was me, right? That was me. Everybody's got to do, you got to do you, right? So, um, but which reminds me, uh, this past weekend, what was it? Uh, Saturday, right? When my wife and I, uh, unless we're out of town, we're off on uh, one of our little jaunts or whatever, right? We have my grandson all day long. He's a little three-year-old, right? He's just this, he's grandpa's little buddy kind of thing. He's got Grammy wrapped around his little finger, which is, I'm told where it's supposed to be, but it drives me nuts some days. But anyway, she found this really cool thing for him to do. She likes to find these little outings, right? Well, the Bucknell University football team was doing a field day for kids. And I'm like, he's three, 
are you going to do? Give him a ball and just let him run around the field and do whatever. And um, I was pleasantly surprised because he did really, really well. And these 20 something football players and the coaches and all that did a friggin' awesome job with the kids. Um, but um, it, cool things came out for me. Like I want to do something like this for the school, right? Because what they had were different stations and at each station, everybody got a chance to try a particular skill and the coach is just, it was just a little snapshot kind of thing. Right. But there was a tour of the locker room and all that kind of stuff. And I originally thought, I mean, he's not going to get jazzed about the locker room. Right. But he watches these other little kid shows and he recognized a freaking a bench press machine um, all by himself and stuff. Right. So it was really, really cool. But another cool thing came out of it because to motivate the players, in a nonverbal, you need to get your shit together kind of, right? right? I want to do this in a dojo. I, I don't think I'm going to use the same words, but we'll, the, the, the leadership is going to have to talk about this. So what they have is they have this board, right? It's a magnetic board. And so they have three pictures at the top, right? So uh, the one at the far left, right? So I guess that would be here for you guys, right? The far left, right, um, was a picture of a lion, male lion, sleeping on a warm rock, Okay. And uh, the word above it or below it was full, right? Like they had just had a full meal and they're going to kick back and take a nap, right? So they're, they're satisfied, right? Everything's whatever, right? And then in the next one, they had um, like a, they had a, I think it was a, a tiger maybe, but it was like wandering around, right? Upright. It was wandering around and everything. And the word was hungry, Right. And then the next one was another one that, like, was just, you could see it in the eyes, right? Hadn't eaten in a while and whatnot, right? And the word they had there was starving, okay? And so uh, the idea was if the, if the player's name was under hungry, right, they're showing up for practice, they're on time, they're doing their weight training, whatever right? They're, they're at practice. They're doing what they need to be doing. They're keeping their grades up and stuff like that, right? So they're hungry, right? They want to play. They're, everything is good, right? If they're going above and beyond, they show up early before practice to get some extra weight training in, right? They're getting extra tutoring in classes to make sure that they stay qualified for the football team, all this stuff, right? Then their name goes under starving, right? Because they, they want more than just good enough, Right. And then if they were taking time off more than late for practice, I mean, like showing up, grades are slipping, stuff like that. Well, then you must be complacent. You must be OK. Right. So the, the player was trying to explain this to a three year old, but I got it because Stellan's just like, yeah, <laughs> you know, but uh, all the, all the players last names were on a little strip that was laminated with a magnet on it. And then they moved. Right. And so this player who was giving us the tour said it was like happiest day, right? When his name was moved from hungry to starving, right? Because people wanted to be in that level because they, you know, ultimately coming out of university or college football, they're hoping to get picked up by a bigger league or, you know, whatever, right? They're, they're hoping for other things. So this was the, this was the thing, right? They're showing that, that, that they're not operating like somebody who's hungry. Like, you know, I could eat, Right. What do you want? Well, I don't know. What do you want? Right? Somebody who's starving, put something in front of me. Right? Somebody who's starving will do whatever is necessary to get the meal. Right? That's different from somebody who's like, well, you know, there's food in the cabinet, cabinets. So I can eat whatever I want. I'm hungry. Yeah, well, let's go look and see what's there. Right? I'll eat. Right? I'll be full. I mean, I'll be, I'll be good. Right? I can wait to the next meal, whatever. Okay. It's what you do when you're hungry, right? You grab a bite to eat. Okay. Starving. Okay. You would never hear somebody who's starving look at a menu and go, that's disgusting. Okay. Somebody who's full. <laughs> you're not going to see me moving for days, dude. I am stuffed. Right. This, and I, I thought this was brilliant. Right. My wife thought it was brilliant. She looked at me and I went, oh, yeah. I'm not sure if we'll, how we'll use the words, but students need something like that, right? 
as a way to, you know, and also works with peer pressure as well. Nobody wants to be in the place that everybody, you know, well, that's not nice. It's the 21st century. We can't make people feel like that. Maybe that's the reason why people are falling behind. Everybody's, everybody's racing for average, but better. Right? Average does not change the world. Average does not. I don't know. I'm not going to go there because lots of people have already, you know, been convinced that. See, let's not talk about that because that makes people feel bad. Or your definition's different than mine. I know. I know. You know how much flat Ian, Ian uh, or Elon Musk took about, you know, his kids don't even like him and blah, blah, blah. I mean, yeah, I, I love it. Right? I, I love when people just soak up the news. Because never forget that the news is selling advertising space so they can make money to pay their expenses, including payroll. So careful what you get lured around with. Um, those little hooks that snag your nose. Okay? But, uh, and I know I shared this story before, but probably right after it happened, uh, but Elon Musk uh, was a guest host on Saturday Night Live, right? And I don't watch it. I saw it secondhand, right? But he came out and normally people, they come out and they do their best at being a comedian or whatever. And he comes out and he goes, um, to all those who have, a, who have a problem with me, right? I'm reinventing the electric car. I'm going to put... Uh, human beings on Mars in my lifetime. And he mentioned something else, something like that, right? And he said, did you really think I was just another chill guy? Or did you think I'd just be another chill guy? Right? So, um, yeah. And why don't his kids like him? See, it gets in the news, right? Don't like him, don't like him. I knew lots of rich kids, okay? They didn't like their parents, Right? It usually became because their parents ended up having to tell them no at some point. And they were used to hearing yes all the time. So their routine was, I ask, they give it to me. I ask, they give it to me. I ask, no, I ask again, they give it to me. Right? There's a hard, fast, no, you're not getting this at all. If you want it, get a damn job. And the parent doesn't fold and it breaks that routine. Of course. Of course, they're not going to like them. Just like any parent that's ever gone through a divorce and had to do child custody things. Hopefully, you have a court system like we have around here where they're really, really smart about things. Where, um, you know, the kid wants to go live with the parents that, or the parent that gives them whatever they want. So, they have to cage, right? Well, dad's mean. He always says no. I'm going to go live with mom or I'm going to go live with dad because he always, right? Because up to a certain age, the decisions are made how? Based on pleasure and, you know, attraction to pleasure, avoidance of pain. Okay? It's not made with a discerning mindset. Of course, that can be said about people that are three times that old as well. Anyway, anything else? I keep looking over here because I see James' picture there and it's bigger than it is right there. But my camera is right there. So, but me staring at that one-eyed cyclops with two little glowing lines beside it. Uh, it's kind of weird. Anyway, so is that it? Are we good? Yes, that is it. All right, so fall camp, September 30th, October 1st and 2nd. And then if you can't make it for that, or if you can make it for that, uh, January, first full weekend, because the holiday weekend is split, right? So the first full weekend, 6th, 7th, and 8th of January is our um, – New Year's Dicomiosi, our New Year's kickoff, yes, pun intended, uh, seminar. And I have not picked a theme for that yet. But if you get on that now, like you can still, I think, until the end of the month, right, on fall camp, you can still like, save like 75 bucks for the whole weekend. It was 100 bucks, but you missed out on that one. So um, 75 on that one. And after that, it goes to full price. Um, fall camp, uh, do we have a price listed on, on the page yet for that? For Dicomiosi? Yeah. Uh, so. That's where we have like a big celebration dinner Saturday night at a Japanese restaurant. And 
celebrate Hatsumi Sensei's birthday and my birthday because that's my birthday weekend. Anyway. <laughs> um, yes, is there it is. What is it? Uh, right now, it's save 100 bucks, so it's 250 till the end of September. You know what? If they do it by the end, so eight days, right? Eight days. If they do it by the end of August, right? Drop an extra 50 bucks off of it. Can't beat that. Well, other people have. People are giving this shit away. And you know, what the, you know how people treat zero, right? No value. Okay, that's it. I'm done. All right. So uh, thanks for joining us again, right? Uh, you know what the next steps are, right? Get signed up for uh, one of the upcoming uh, seminars. If you haven't done it, um, go over to onlineninjaacademy.com forward slash Kuden podcast, all one string, right? And subscribe because if you're a subscriber, we send out extra stuff. There's like sometimes there's midweek lessons. Sometimes I'll cover something on Kuden and I'll do an extra video kind of thing to dive into some aspect of that even more. And then I send that out to people, um, you know, whatever. Right. So some of our best students, um, are Kuden subscribers. So, um, anyway, but don't just rely on, say, here's the, here's the problem with relying on Facebook or whatever posting we do online. Right. Um, and I know how some of these things are inconceivable, which is why they usually sneak up and bite you in the ass. Right. Um, if that's how you're doing everything, right, and for whatever reason, Facebook pulls the plug or see people are like, Facebook's not going anywhere. Yeah. OK, what if they go to a paid model and suddenly now you got to pay a subscription? Right. Not paying for that. Right. So um, and then you will the point is you will lose connections with. Right. All those other things. So. Um, we try to get folks into onto a, a subscriber list. That way, you know first. As soon as I create that graphic and create this this uh, session on Restream, right? That goes onto an email and goes right out to Kuden uh, subscribers. Uh, they know first. They can start planning before everybody else, and then other emails go out to other ones, and it's just there's a trickle down effect, right? So, um, so go over and do that, right? Um, you can go to James will post the, the uh, things you can go to online Ninja Academy forward slash events and just see the little snippet about what we're kind of what we're covering uh, for fall camp. But is it on, what, what is the what's the URL for fall camp? Is it fall dash camp dash or is it fall dash ninja dash camp dash 2022? It's fall dash camp dash 2022. Links in, the comments. Links in the comments. There you go. OK, so go over, take a look at that stuff. Right. Um, I know it's a little bit long, but um, I wanted to make sure people knew what they were getting out of these things, because you're not just going to a seminar. Right. The way you define things. Creates the ceiling. And the limit for how far you can go. So be careful how you define things. And that's it. That's all I have. James, thank you very much. Everybody else, thank you very much. And we'll see you next time on Kuden.